I hope to change the direction a little bit of the way that we look at traceability today. <clears throat> I am Joe Leathers. I am the general manager of the Four Sixes Ranch. I've been with the ranch for 18 years. Uh, in 2011, up until 2011, since 1870, we'd never operated anywhere except in Texas on our deeded land, other than a short time that the original founder moved cattle in the Indian Territory of Oklahoma because of a drought. In 2011, we made a big shift uh, because uh, up to that point, I thought I knew what a drought was, but uh, I learned that uh, there's a difference between a seasonal shortage of rainfall and a famine. And we were down to nothing, no grass, no water. And so I will not bore you with a lot of details, but we, we wanted to hold our genetics together that we'd worked on for over 100 years. We have second and third generation people working for the ranch, and if we sold our cows, then what do you do with all those folks that had given their life to the ranch? And so the owner and I talked, and much to her credit, she said, we're going to bite the bullet and we're going to make it work. So I went on the hunt for grass. <clears throat> Since that time, up until 2011, we had run a base herd of about seven to 8,000 mother cows and retained ownership of all the yearlings and fed our own cattle. I moved uh, through the leases that I acquired in Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, Nevada. Uh, we moved between four and 5,000 head of cows out of state. And to be honest, I thought, why me, Lord? Because it was not fun, uh, and I got educated. And in some cases, I got an education, and there's a difference. But right now, today, we operate in uh, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Texas, and we run about a base herd of around, somewhere around 12,000 cows. So it's funny how God takes you through things in your life because he has a plan, and I truly believe that one of those plans was for me to learn what it means to move cattle across state lines and how to track those cattle. So that's one of the hats that I wear. Another hat that I wear is uh, I'm a board of director of the Texas Southwest Cattle Raisers Association, and so I have an opportunity to lobby and, and uh, to try to help with uh, the political process that either will help or hinder the cattle industry in Texas. Because of that, I became involved in the NCBA and do the same thing nationally. And so I've learned that a lot of times in the cattle industry, we, we go things as a reactive approach. We react to policy. We react to diseases. We react to markets. And I, I have preached if you will, and I do do a little lay preaching. I have preached for years that every opportunity that we have in the cattle industry, we need to become proactive. We need to develop the rules. We need to develop the laws. We need to have a seat at the table. So that's three of the hats that I wear. The fourth hat that I wear is uh, I became an animal health commissioner. Gosh. Dr. Schwartz, when was it? I don't even remember the exact time, but this is the third or fourth year that I've been Animal Health Commissioner. And to be quite honest, Andy, whenever I became a commissioner, as a producer, I really didn't look at the Animal Health Commission and the state vets as my friends or partners. Just like I really didn't look at the federal vets as partners or friends. But very quickly, I realized, and I guess I always knew it in the back of my mind, but I'm telling you all this because I think there's a perception from the stakeholder groups that we're not partners. That y'all aren't necessarily the enemy, 
but all they see is regulation, regulation, regulation. Am I right? Everybody do like this. And so I learned very quickly that the, the state commission and the federal vets are there to protect the industry that I make my living from. And so in the real sense, y'all work for the industry. Just like I'm a servant of the industry. Okay? So that's four hats that I wear. Then what should have been named at the first of it, but I saved it for last because I want to put it in context, the other three hats that I wear is a husband and a father and a grandfather. And yes, I have four children. I have ten grandchildren, eight boys and two girls. And God bless them, I've got one more on the way. So, in reality, they are my top priority, which means that everything that I do, every decision that I make, every time I speak in something like this, every time I lobby in, in Austin or Washington, I do it with those in mind because they are the future of this industry and the future of this nation. So. I say all that because I think we need to start focusing our attention in a little bit different direction. Now, because of the hats that I wear and because of being an animal health commissioner, I see the need for animal traceability. The reality of life is we live in a time, and I know that I'm speaking to the choir in this group of people. First thing I learned about speaking is know your audience. But I understand that y'all understand what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. We live in a world today that a terrorist attack could happen at any moment. If there was anthrax, TB, hoof and mouth, God forbid any of those happen, what would it do to the cattle industry? They destroy it. If we had the ability to quarantine, trace the cattle, we could not only minimize but maybe shut down the problem. And we're not talking about just cattle well-being, we're talking about animal and human and the survival of our nation. So it's a big deal. I understand that. And I'm not trying to dramatize that or make it bigger than what it really is, but it's a fact of life. Now let's bring it down to something a little smaller. In Texas we deal with that little critter called the fever tick. And that thing has moved out of its original quarantine zone where we've been fighting and containing it forever. If we'd had a traceability program, uh, the state of Texas wouldn't have had to come up with another seven million dollars for our budget at the commission. Or at least not all of it. There would have been producers that would have never been quarantined and been in it if we'd have known where the cattle came from. Am I right, Andy? So, you know, we talk about is there a premium for our calves if we, if we get into a traceability program. No, there's not at this point. Do I think there will be? I think eventually. But there's not right now. But I think we're focusing our view on the wrong thing. I don't know about y'all. How many are producers in here? Raise your hand. How many of y'all have drought insurance? Raise your hand. How many of you hedge your cattle for risk, for risk protection? Raise your hand. All you're doing is buying an insurance policy to cover your, to cover your basis on when you hedge your cattle. All you're doing is buying an insurance policy in case you get in a drought. Folks, let me tell you something. We worry about what it costs as producers. One outbreak, if they were to quarantine us at Guthrie, Texas, it would take, and we had to test or do whatever we had to do at Guthrie, Texas, on 160,000 acres, it would take me three weeks just to gather the cows. 
And then we wouldn't get them all gathered because of the brush. It's not realistic. But if they said, oh, there's a potential outbreak there, has this cow been here, there, and yonder? And I say, well, I don't know. I've got the records because we started ID and cattle in 2011 and 12. And I've got the program right now today going. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a little bit. But see, I understand the need for it as an animal health commissioner, but I also stand, understand the real world common sense problems that come with it. And I'm not even going to mention all of them that we've been rehashing and talking about since 1998. And I heard every one of them again yesterday. Now, I applaud y'all for the work that you've done. It's tremendous. The hours and the years that you have spent on this. But to be perfectly honest with you, as a producer sitting out there yesterday, I heard the same thing again. Am I right? Do you like this? Because I know I'm right. I did not one time hear a proposal for a solution. I heard it go around in circles. And I told Neil when he asked me, I spoke at Fort Worth on this, and I told Neil then, I, he asked me if I would come speak, and I told him, I said, Neil, yes, I will if we're going to do something besides talk about the problems. If we're just going to talk about the problems, i got other things to do. Now, you got to understand a little something about me. I'm, I'm a very, very patient man. But I don't come from an office. When I, when I got here, on the morning that I got up to fly here in a company jet, I crawled out of a teepee and a bedroll. I'd been in Montana and Nevada weaning kids. And I flew here. And when I leave here today, I'm going to fly to San Antonio. I'm going to speak, and then we're going to, and then we're going to have our horse sale at home. And the day after that horse sale, I'm loading back up, and I'm going back to Wyoming to wean calves on four ranches in Wyoming, and I'm going to crawl back into that TPM bedroll. I've learned this industry literally from the ground up. At Guthrie, Texas, we've got state-of-the-art facilities. We've got our own, vet, our own vets. We've got a horse operation. We're, I get tickled every time I think about this. I hosted the, e the, the EPA, <clears throat> some of the staff members, some of the head staff members from Washington. Y'all remember WOTUS? Well, I, I was chairman of that committee when we were arguing with WOTUS about WOTUS. And <clears throat> be quite honest, they, they think I am hard to get along with, and I was hard to get along with because they were arrogant, rude, and hard to get along with, and unrealistic. But I tried to bridge the gap with knowledge of who we in the industry actually are, and I hosted them at the ranch, which I thought was a pretty risky deal anytime you have EPA or environmentalists come onto your property. So we had dinner that night, and you know what? One of the first things they asked me, do y'all have any modern technology? And I said, no, you'll have to go outside to use the bathroom. But the next morning, I took them down to our horse facility. We collect in, in, in embryos, we freeze embryos, we ship embryos, we freeze and collect semen. We breed over 1,250 outside mares a year. We stand about 20 studs. We ship semen and, and embryos all over the world. Uh, We've shipped horses. We've helped write the health rules to ship horses to over in foreign countries that they hadn't shipped horses to before. I'm talking cutting edge stuff. But <clears throat> you go out in our pasture and we've got really, really good pipe pens, swinging gates. And then you go out to our lease country and you've got pens that are less than adequate. Most of them are prolapsed. They've been prolapsed since the day that we leased it. The owners won't put any money into it. You can't hardly get cattle. 
I was trying to I was trying to get EID tag numbers to ship some cows in Nevada about three days ago. I've got a pen. I mean, we got like a thousand cows there. I'm talking huge country. And we get them gathered. The fences you can't keep them in one spot. We'd strip the calves off, ship them, turn the cows back out, gathered the cows back the next day, and and we're going to try to get all the health requirements on it. I've got a pen that will hold maybe 200 cows without going ahead and falling down and you got 400 cows and we still got to get the tag numbers would have been much easier and more common sense to load them buggers on the truck and when they got to where they was going wind them on that end because I had facilities there easier on the cattle easier on the men it's snowing it's raining I'm wet my men are wet, we're cold, we're tired, we're dirty. And you're trying to get tag numbers. But you know what? We had to preg those cows. And as a producer, I'm going to preg those cows regardless. I'm going to figure out a way to get it done. And I keep hearing about the speed of commerce. It's got to be the speed of work to start with. No problem. I can wand those cows before that guy pregging can get done and he's fast. That's not an issue. And they tell me, back here I had supper with a gentleman back there from Allflex the other night and he's telling me he can make it easier on me than that and I'm going to hold him to it. So my point is, I understand the real world problems with this. And the very real concerns that the producers have because of, I'm a producer. So my issue therefore comes, how do you make it happen? Well, let me tell you what I, from a business perspective, perspective, what I can get from that one reading from an EID tag. I can wand that cow. And I can tell you the total number of cows that we have on the ranch. Now, mind you, and the only reason I'm telling you these numbers is because I want you to understand. Uh, I, I understand small operations because I was raised on a small operation. My dad had about 50 cows and we raised cotton. I've worked on medium-sized operations, yearlings, cows, and I've worked on large operations. But right now, like I say, we have somewhere around 12,000 cows. We operate on somewhere just a little over a million acres if you take into consideration the least country. So I, I know how this is going to work. I know how the wheat fields work in, in Baylor County, Texas, where you had turn out thousands and thousands of head of stocker cattle on wheat and there's nothing but electric fence around them and no pens. When I talk about being flexible here in a little bit, I want you to understand where I'm coming from, okay? But from that one wand, I can tell you how many total number of cows that we have that 4-6 is on. I can tell you whether those cows were bought or whether they were ranch raised. I can tell you if they're black, black baldy, or red. I can tell you uh, what ranch they're on. You know, the premise number is all going to call my office at Guthrie, Texas. But just in a matter of minutes, I can tell you if that one particular cow is in Nevada, Montana, whatever ranch it is in Montana, or in Wyoming, whatever four ranches she's on there, I can tell you if I bought that cow, I can tell you where she was bought. And if we preg that cow and she's open and we ship her, and I've wanted her, and it's been recorded, I can tell you where I sent her, whether she got her head cut off or whether she went to the sale. And it took me about a year to a year and a half to get the bugs worked out of just my operation. Just to do what I wanted to do. I can tell you when that cow was pregged and what the vaccination program was on that cow. And the amount of data that I could enter into that as a commercial operator or a registered operator or a stocker operator, it's unlimited. So do I think that there's a premium going to come for, for EID in your kids? Yes, because I think the amount of data that you can put into it and the tools that you get from it so that you can manage your herd to improve the quality of your cattle and your herd is there. 
The problem comes <clears throat> for me operating on the ground is the, the mentality of the cowboys and the people that you deal with. I mean, and I've been there, been there, done that. Whenever I was just a cowboy, all I worried about is the horse I was going to ride, how good he was, <clears throat> fixing something that was broke on my saddle, <clears throat> roping, and if you're in Nevada, whether I needed to shine the hubcaps is on my spur leathers. But that's what they worry about. And, and, and you talk about modern technology, the cowboy mentality goes, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. And it takes you about a year to change the mentality, or a year and a half, and then it's like, well, we've been doing it all along. It's not that big a deal. And then you've got the mentality of technology. Uh, our background and yard that we built was just barely, wasn't even totally through with construction, and it's not your typical background yard that we built in Texas. Send all of our calves there, but the, the gentleman that lives there is a very good man, very good hand, extremely intelligent, good cowboy, good Christian man, and he was so, so frustrated last year, getting all the mass number of cattle in, trying to trying to work out the problems with it, trying to learn the technology because like most of us in the cattle industry, we're just a little bit past smoke signals. And when you start talking about computers, you get this deer in the headlights look. And I'd call him to see how things are going. I'd be in Wyoming or wherever shipping cattle and I'd say, Fred, how's things going? And, oh my goodness, he was upset. And you know, it wasn't about the work are the stress, are the numbers of cattle coming in, because he had that. It's like that. It was the technology. Scared him to death. And I finally finally told, showed him what FaceTime was and I said, when you call me or I call you, go to FaceTime because I want to see the look on your face before you open your mouth. <laughs> so, my point being, it's going to take the cattle industry and the cowboys and the ranchers a little while to get comfortable with technology. Y'all got it. Y'all understand it. Y'all have dealt with it. You deal with it every day. I told my wife years ago when we were at North Campus the Sixties, we homeschooled all of our kids. I said, we don't need a cell phone and we don't need a computer. Well, right now today, I've got a laptop, I've got an iPhone. My wife's got a laptop, she's got an iPhone. We've got two computers in the office and five screens. And I don't know how that we would live without any one of them. So technology is there, technology is advancing. And if we implement this and get the traceability program in, I promise you, those guys back there in the back of that room that are helping with this sponsor, and thank you by the way, that are sponsoring this will come up with some more innovative technology that will make our life easier when they see a need for it. I think that we need to rethink the way we look at traceability because we're still talking about the problem since 98 so apparently something's wrong with the way we're looking at it. I want y'all to understand that there is a difference between a vision and a goal. Somebody tell me what a vision is. Come on now, this isn't, you're not in Baptist church. A vision is something unusual that typically is hard to accomplish that will be an influence, a positive influence on future generations. Now, I didn't say today. I didn't say in a week. I didn't say in a year. A vision is something that is accomplished, that is bigger than we are, God-sized project, and goals are nothing more than markers to get us there. Okay? Now, I've heard a lot of discussion 
about the problems with animal disease traceability. I have not one time from the leadership in this room or anywhere else anybody tell me what the vision is. It's a big, big project as you very well know. That old saying, how do you eat an elephant? You eat an elephant one bite at a time. I also have not heard any plans on how to accomplish it except in this group. <clears throat> now who's that leaving out? Now partly it's, it's our own fault. Leaves out the stakeholders. Am I right? When Dr. Schwartz took over at the Animal Health Commission, Andy, I'm picking on you this morning because I see a friendly face back there and I don't know a lot of these people. So if, if, if they throw things at me, you gotta, he's pretty big. He's going to come save me. The reason that you don't see stakeholders involved is because of fear. Lack of trust causes fear. Change causes uncertainty and fear. And to be quite honest, the things that we had in the industry have received from the federal government will make you, make you want to turn and stand up and fight. And that's what ranchers do. Boy, y'all have witnessed it in these, in these meetings, Neil, every time you've gone to one. You've heard the same problems. When we were at Fort Worth and I spoke down there on the panel, oh my goodness, I heard lots of very passionate complaints and opposition. But I tried something, and Neil was there when we went into our breakout sessions in the little groups. And, and we had one or two of the most opposed. And we went into those little breakout groups, and they were still passionately in opposition about the same thing. And I said, how, how could you fix it? And you know, it took less than 10 or 15 minutes of just talking. And those guys, those men, those intelligent leaders of the industry were coming up with solutions. And I saw right then that there needs to be a partnership created between the federal and state officials and the industry stakeholders. Now, how do you do that? You got to break down the walls of mistrust. And you got to make them a partner. When Andy took over at the as heading up the Animal Health Commission in Texas, we had a you know the fever tick issue, and there there was ranchers that had real issues with that. I mean, my goodness, it was costing them to the point that they were they were about ready to get out, which wouldn't have been good for us because that's the way you kill the fever tick. Got to have cattle, and so we suggested, well, why don't you get them together and let them help devise a plan that'll work for them. And you too, because they saw the need to eradicate the tick and control the fever tick. And I think we've had, Andy, you speak for yourself, but I think we've had some very positive results. Same thing with trick. Got a trick working group of producers. And they've come up with some real good, good rules and regulations. And you know, it, it, it amazes me how they can be, how the stakeholder groups and, and uh, leadership in the industry in Texas and across this nation can be so opposed to what you're trying to do, the people in this room, but whenever they get like-minded producers that help put to the rules and regulations together and then bring it back to the producer, it happens. Because there's been a partnership created. So, how do we do that? How does this group do that? I personally, and this is just me talking, I personally do not believe that you will ever put together an animal disease traceability program on your own 
that will be accepted by the industry and that will work smooth unless the stakeholders are the ones that put it together. Now what's that going to look like? This is just my opinion and I threw it out there at Fort Worth and I still think it's the only way that you're going to get it done. I think you put together a group of men, not a big group. My, have you ever cooked a piece of spaghetti and tried to push it across the table? It doesn't go anywhere. That's what I told my crew the other day. I said, you ever tried to, you ever tried to push a, a wet noodle? And they looked at me and I said, that's what you guys are like today. But you can get a hold of that spaghetti and you can pull it and it'll string out behind you and follow. You got to lead. And if you get more than 10 to 12 people is too many, but for something of this size, you're probably going to have to have at least that many. But if you get too many people, then you got too many suggestions. You go off chasing rabbits instead of going hunting, and you don't get the problems solved. So my suggestion is you get a group of men from large and small or medium-sized operation Calcaf. Two men. You get two men from the stalker world that put together stalker cattle, large and small operators. You get together sale barn, large and small. You get together feedlot representation. You get together packer representation. And I don't mean to offend you, any of you PhDs in here. You have one or two of y'all as a consultant, okay? And you're going to have to have one main focused chairman of that group. And any time they get off base or they go to just complaining and whining, put them back on course and keep focused on the goals. Y'all listed the goals. Y'all put the goals together. Y'all put the problems together from all the groups that you've had. You listed, I think, 14 of the top ones yesterday. Put them up on the blackboard and say, today we're going to solve this problem. And you take the first bite out of that elephant. And you sit there with minds of vision-minded operators. And you solve each and every problem and then you put together a prototype and you get a group of large and small ranchers to run the prototype, the test, if you will. Y'all get involved in it. You randomly pull a number off of an animal at any point in time, trace it back, see how fast it goes back, how accurate it works. And you run it with just that small group of people until it works. And when it works, and you've got what it cost, you've got the bugs worked out, and you've got a group of producers saying it works, then you take it back to the stakeholder groups, propose it to them, and I can't guarantee any, anything, but I'll bet you a hole in the donut you get it passed. And then you make it voluntary. And you get the industry started on a program. And then you build on it and you cross whatever bridges you have to cross. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to find producers that will think outside the fence that they're in. See, most of us can't think past where our cattle are running or where our lives routinely go. And our problems that we have on the ranch. So you have to have Individuals that are willing to think outside the box. Individuals that are willing to think about somebody else besides themselves and their own world and concern. Now I'm going to point the finger out here. Every person in here has got an office. And every person in here has been given a directive of this is what you're responsible for and this is what you got to do. Am I right? They like it. Human nature. And I heard it from some of the speakers yesterday, and I'm not making fun, I'm just being realistic. You get focused on your world. 
And for the order for this to be a vision to be accomplished, you've got to think outside that office and think about the decisions that I make will affect that guy over there and the decision that he makes affects that other guy over there and the decision that he makes affects the industry. That's a partnership. So you got to think outside your fences. You got to think about the future generations and what it's going to look like to them. And I'm going to just finish up, and I, and I want us to focus here, and I'm not going to spend long on this, but what's traceability worth? Uh, right now, there's no premium if we do it on stocker cattle. It's just a cost, if you look at it strictly from that standpoint. I think, personally, if I've got data on my calves, and John Brown, that has 20 calves that he's wanting to sell and he's got data on that calf and <clears throat> somebody's wanting to buy my calves and I can print that sheet off and I can tell him that calf was born in this range, calf's going to weigh this much, calf got vaccinated at this age, he got rebacked at this age, this is what my herd is, cows and bulls, I think there's added value to be had there. I promise you, if I'm selling calves, our calves, and I've got it, it's going, it's going to cost Ross Wilson a little bit more money. I'm going to get it. All right. I, I don't think you need to be talking about the future that if you don't do it, your calves are going to be discounted. Tell me what, tell me that what I own is going to be discounted because of, of the way I operate. Oh my goodness. Look for trouble, guys. Will there be a discount for those calves eventually someday? There's a good chance of it. Look at it as an insurance policy, like I talked about a while ago. Look at it as convenience. I'm going to tell you something. I, I heard, and, and guys, I pray that y'all get off of this kick. One tag. One source of ID. Don't go with three or four, oh, don't, well, you can use three or four different, don't do that. The bright tag, forget that. I've moved thousands of cows on that stupid bright tag, and you're trying to read this thing like this, and she's hitting you, dirt's blowing, snow's blowing. You ever tried to read one of them in a dirt storm on a black cow and then have to look at the tattoo? It's a night, I know you have, you're vets. It's a nightmare. Tags don't stay in. The only a bright tag is a little bit like a windmill. The only cheap thing about a windmill is the wind. A bright tag, the only good thing about it is it's cheap and y'all give it to us. But it is a pain in the butt to use. And you talk about stressful on cows. I can run them cows down a chute right now and not even catch their head, just shoot run them, and supposedly I can do it going down the alley. I'm going to hold you to it eventually. But just in a second, I can have all the information I need off that cow and never catch her and lose very few of the tags. Most, most of those tags are lost on a big round bale that nobody cuts strings on. Other than that, they stay in. One of the problems you're going to have, and it's going to be a minor one, I guess, but you've got to figure it out. What do you do with the cows that lost the tag and you re-tag her? i tell you what we've done, and I hope there's a better way, but we've put a dangle tag in the other ear that's got a, a, a number on it. And when we wander, we write that other tag number down, and so if she loses one tag either or, we've still got the ability to trace back to the original tag. And then in fall, when we replace, we'll replace the one that was lost and we'll give it a number. Simple fix. It's not always not 100%. And none of this program's ever going to be 100%. And y'all are going to have to get flexible on what a realistic goal is on a percentage of traceback to start a program. You're going to have to get a little flexible in, in this group. You're going to have to put together that you, that if you put one together, 
You're going to have to figure out uh, where the point source of entering the tags is going to be because I promise you, I don't know about other eastern part of the y'all states, but the eastern Texas is going to fight this tooth and nail. They don't even cut their bull calves. They don't earmark. They don't vaccinate. If mama needs some groceries, they trap a cow and, and pull a calf off and go sell it at sale and go buy some groceries. So there's some real issues going to have to be worked out to start a program. But you're going to have to get off of being so rigid that you're never going to get anybody to buy into it to get it started.